my guest today is from Cycle Alaska, the uh, uh, bike shop up in Juneau. His name is John McConaughey. He's from New Zealand. Uh, thanks for being on here, John. You're welcome. So I'm sure the question that you always get is how does one go from New Zealand to uh, starting a bike shop in Juneau? That's a rather circuitous route. Um, I came over here in the 70s under a sports scholarship and swam at the University of Oregon and Central Washington, um, or Washington State University, I should say. Um, so that's what initially brought me to the States. And then from there, um, after graduating, I met this beautiful blonde from Spokane, Washington, and uh, we moved down to the Eugene Springfield area for a couple of years and uh, worked down there. And then a job offer came up in Juneau, Alaska, working at the Juneau Racket Club. I've been working at clubs down in Oregon and uh, it seemed like a natural transition. And like a lot of people coming to Alaska, we gave ourselves two years and, and if we can handle that, maybe we stay, maybe we won't. But like a lot of others, there was no sort of two year anniversary. We just decided we loved it here. And 41 years later, still, very much in love with Juneau and Alaska. Excellent. So when did you start the shop? Um, we started the retail side of the business in 2010. Um, the tour side had been operating since 1996, and we bought the company in 2005. So we operated strictly as a tour rental company for about six years, and then transition which already been in our plans to have a retail aspect to it also jeff mm -hmm. what have you seen as far as change as far as maybe like uh, the biking culture in the time that you've uh, been owning the shop <clears throat> well two of the major changes are more commuters um, more people riding to work for different reasons um, and the other thing is a growth in the mountain biking flow track pump track sort of culture and, and opportunities and those two pieces and I think coming a close third might be people using the bike as a as a form of fitness as a um, low impact way to get some aerobic points by by cycling mm -hmm. as far as trails go it looks like um, I live down in Ketchikan <clears throat> and it looks like there's just an extensive amount of trails I guess comparatively um, have you seen the the, the trail um, program, are they increasing? Are they building more trails? Like how, how is that? They are, and then upgrading existing trails. There's been a great deal of work done on numerous trails around uh, Juneau, and a lot of different um, bodies have been involved with that, from trail mix, you know, through the Forest Service, City Borough of Juneau, Juneau Mountain Bike Alliance, um, and then also the state uh, parks have also been very involved. So it's been a combined effort. And as a result, a lot of trails have been upgraded. Some new trails have been added. And then on some different trails, there's been some single track um, downhill trails that have sort of come available, not very long as far as length of the trail, but some opportunities for people. Mm -hmm. What are some of the, like your favorite uh, trails. I think we'll kind of go in, in two parts here. We'll talk about the mountain bike, the trail stuff, and then we'll get to some of the commuter stuff. Uh, but what are some of the trails that you like the most? Well, it, they they won't be any surprise to anybody living in Juneau, but I really enjoy Perseverance. And then Treadwell Ditch, they've done a lot of work on, on that trail, upgrading that trail over the years. And at some point here, that trail, you'll be able to traverse it all the way from Cropley Lake at Eagle Crest all the way down to Douglas. And that's about... 16 miles of trail following the old Treadwell Ditch, which was a ditch built to collect water and then take it down to the Treadwell Mines to be used in the mines. So it's um, once that's complete, that will be a world-class um, trail opportunity for people. And it's and lately, too, I've been riding the trails on a gravel bike, which has been a lot of fun. I'm an average mountain biker um so I, I do okay there's certain points i step off the bike and walk through the things i just know <laughs> um i'm not going to enjoy too much if i fall off um but having a lot of fun on gravel bikes which is basically a road bike but with larger tires about two to three times the size of a typical you know drop handlebar racing bike type tire and, and they are pretty compliant to the surface you're on. You rattle your teeth a little bit on the downhills, but um, I don't fly downhill anyway. 
Yeah. I used to ride when I lived in California, I would ride my bike to, to work in the morning at school and it was just really nice. But when I got out in the country where I lived, there wasn't much of a shoulder. And so I got that, that gravel tire there just so it was a little bit, uh, it was more efficient on the roads than a more aggressive tire. But then if, you know, a car was coming and I felt I wanted to get off the road a little bit, I could do that safely. Yeah. And it's a growing, um, we were selling more and more, actually we sell three or four times more gravel bikes than we do just the, the traditional drop handlebar skinny tire road bike um it is really that's one of the changes that we're seeing and it's such a versatile bike you know you can commute on it you can do trails on it you can do roads obviously on it um or you can put racks on it and panniers and, and use it as a touring bike so it's kind of a swiss army knife in a way of, of bikes what's your most preferred like for your own individual use uh, as far as bikes are concerned yeah. or just, or maybe style of bike. Um, you know, it varies. Um, if, uh, it depends on what I'm training for or what's sort of taken my interest that, uh, at certain times it's mountain biking cause I just really enjoy being off the road and in the forest. And it's, um, and if it's a really wet rainy day and it's nothing worse than being on a road bike and cars going by, you're kicking up grime and, and, uh, getting wet and, and cold um, and much prefer to be in a, in a trail in the woods. Of course, you're still going to get wet, but it's just a lot more enjoyable than being on a, on a road. So it varies just depending on what I'm training for and just what sort of catches my interest that day. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I'm actually currently down in Laramie, Wyoming, and we were out in the prairie doing a, doing a, supposed to be about a 12 mile out and back. And we got caught in, bit of a thunderstorm so we turned around we we're coming back and it was kind of fun because it was downhill and it's warm and so that rain you know turns the the prairie into mud and it was kind of fun that the inner kid in me was really excited about that just kind of getting muddy <laughs> but it was warm and i biking up in in, in ketchikan man it's just that cold and it's like you said it's 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 pretty miserable not very enjoyable yeah um, do you see a lot of the, you said your commuter bikes are, um, is kind of the, a, a growing trend in Juno. Is that a year round thing or is it just kind of when, when the weather is good? It's, it is year round for some and they put studded tires on and then maybe, you know, they've got more tend towards more of a fat tire or a plus size tire, you know, 2.8 inch to four, some five on some fat tire bikes. So, that, you know, the, you're changing some of your equipment out um, or just a larger tire that can handle um, a little bit of snow. And so that obviously not as many in the winter as there are in the summertime, but there's, there's, that is growing also. People are doing it year round uh, and enjoying it, and, you know, and just they're dressing for it also. It's, my dad said there's no bad weather, there's just bad gear. <laughs> so just getting the right gear and, and just understanding that, you know, it's, it may not be the perfect day, but at least you're out. I, every time I get on a bike, i got a smile on my face. So mm -hmm. um, I think even in the depths of winter when people are riding, they've got a smile on their face. And, and then being lit up too, obviously, you yeah. need to make certain that you you can be seen. In fact, during the day, if I'm even riding my mountain bike, if I'm riding a little bit of a distance to a trail, I throw lights on um, just when I'm on the road. Just It just makes good sense to do that so people can see you and be aware that you're another piece of um, equipment on the road that they need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Are cars pretty cognizant and pretty alert when it comes to, to bicyclists, cyclists? I think they have become more so, and all the studies show that the more cyclists that are on the road on uh, as a ratio, there's less accidents because motorists are more aware that that is going to be something that's going to be on the road, albeit on the shoulder for the most part, you know, on the other side of the fog line, but that it, it lessens the, the opportunity for accidents. And, and as a result, seeing more and more people on the road here, I think drivers are becoming more and more aware. And, for the most part, if I'm out the road, like down at Thane or North Douglas or out the road, most drivers will um, take the other lane when they pass you if they have that opportunity. Obviously, cars coming, they won't do that, but it's it's really nice. And every time somebody does that, I put my hand up just to wave and say thank you. That was yeah. nice of you. 
I think the most courteous um, drivers that I have seen, not only here in Alaska, but down the lower 48 when I've been riding down there, are the commercial drivers. Um, they, they seem to be just a little bit more uh, tuned to that sort of thing. And, and maybe that's maybe they're on the road more often than most. So mm -hmm. that's, that's always heartening to see that because, you know, you've got a big semi flying by you with a trailer on the back and you're on the side of a freeway and often you don't have to be there, but sometimes when you're transiting from one area to the other, you, you have to be right. and seen them pull over and, and just, that's, it's really nice to see that rather than be buffeted by their, their um, slipstream. Yeah, for sure. So if someone was going to buy a road bike, uh, can you give them, cause I know that you have, uh, you have an, a, a shop online feature on your website and you can ship, uh, bikes. So what would be kind of your, what are you looking for in a bike? If someone says, Hey, I, I'm thinking about a road bike so I can go to work in, uh, what are some things that, the, that he or she should be looking for in a, in a quality road bike? And then what do you offer? Well, I think one of the things we, we ask, we ask a lot of questions to start with because we really want to find out exactly how long they're going to be on the bike, how, what distance are they traveling, what are they going to be using the bike for so that we can make certain we get them on the right type of bike. And then also sizing is critical um, that you get the right size bike for somebody because it's, it's the wrong size and they start to hurt every time they ride for one reason or another. You know, each time they go to the garage and look at their bike, they oh, I don't really don't want to do this. So mm -hmm. that's critical. But when somebody is riding the roads, um, and let's say that there's different elements. If they're training for a triathlon or a bike ride, a, a riding race, um, then obviously we would start to talk to them about a drop handlebar uh, road bike. If they're commuting, um, just the gravel bike I mentioned earlier, or even just a straight bar, um, handlebar bike that has a frame like a road bike, but the handlebar is, is straight and has the same shifting like a, a mountain bike. Um, there's a good number of those styles of bike that would be more than adequate for somebody that maybe is commuting five to 10 miles one way um, a day and you know, 20, 10 to 20 miles a day. Um, if they're going longer, we may might suggest more towards the gravel bike because you can change your hands on the handlebars a little bit more, give you a little more opportunity to um, move around a little bit as, as you're riding. And, and and then also the tire too. You don't, if you're commuting a long way, you don't want to be carrying a heavy, um, highly profiled sort of tire like a mountain bike tire. You know, a slick tire with a little bit of profile on profile on the sides would be would be perfect. Okay. Um, so if you want to do like a race, my brother was really into the racing stuff and he did, well, he wasn't super fast, but he did a couple of centuries down in California. And, um, I could just, when I, he would come to every stop light and he would have to click his shoe out. Um, people who are nervous about clicking in and out, if they're trying to go like, like triathlon or trying to go long distances with that, um, like, is that an added cost? Do you have to get the, the click-in shoes? Have they changed the technology? Is that something to be afraid of? Do you uh, have shoes that click into the pedals? Um, when I'm on my road bike, yes, I, I, I clip in um, and on my gravel bike too. But if I'm starting to get onto trails where or I'm going to go to a trail where it's a little more technical and I'll put flats on so I'm not clipping in because I just want to put that foot down quickly. As I mentioned earlier, I'm okay on trails, but I'm not great. So I like that opportunity to do that but if somebody is you know going to start to race triathlons and so forth clipping in allows you to transfer the power more efficiently from your pedal stroke to the pedal and the crank arm and, um, and moving the bike um, flats with just standard shoes on you lose a lot of the power not a lot but you lose enough um, and the technology has changed somewhat on clip-in. Um, it's nice now some have a little bit of float, meaning you've got like four to five degrees on either side to float the foot a little bit so you're not completely locked in, and, and that's nice to have. The It is interesting. The first time I clipped in, I was going out with two other friends, and they said, John, you just got to remember when you come to the stop sign, you need to you know click your heel out and, and clip out. And, and we practiced a couple of times, but sure enough, when I got to the bottom of the hill, <laughs> got to do it and we just crashed. Oh. And they said, okay, everybody has to learn that. So when I talk to people now and they're going out for the first time with their shoes and, and the cleats and going to clip in, I tell them, look, go to a field somewhere, one of the schools, and 
just practice. And so if you do fall, you're falling on soft ground, not on asphalt or something like that or concrete. So just go out and practice and it just takes a couple of times and then, then you figure it out. Yeah, that was, I, I was pretty intimidated by it, but really it's not that much. You don't have to torque your whole hip or knee or anything like that. It's a pretty simple movement. So it's not something that people should really be afraid of, but it was a, it was an interesting thing to get used to. I see that there's, you have three bikes on uh, your website that are, that are road bikes. Um, obviously components are the main difference when it comes to, to price. So what would a top end road bike have that a, you know, a, I don't want to say lesser, but a, a more affordable uh, price point bike have? Well, part of it could be the frame itself. Um, you know, carbon fiber is, is becoming more and more popular or even titanium. Um, so that, that can start to increase the price, even if the frame itself, for the most part, is aluminum, but the front fork, which the front wheel clips into, that could be carbon fiber. So that can start to make a difference um, in the pricing. And then component groups, each company, whether it be SRAM, Shimano, um, who never have different grades of component groups. And for the most part, um, they're, they're all very, they're great. They work well. And we see enough bikes with different component parts from um, Trek and Kona, who are the two brands we carry most. Um, even their entry-level bikes really work well. And then the further up you go, the components typically get a little bit lighter. Um, they're a little bit more... Um, efficient in shifting um they just uh, have um, a little bit more reliability um, and they sometimes there will be gearing changes like you might go from seven speeds to ten speeds and sometimes nowadays too just going what's called a one by we just have one chain ring up front with your crank arms and pedals and you might have 11 and sometimes now 12 speeds in the back and that's nice to have because now you get you doing away with one of the derailleurs, the front derailleur. And, and so it's um, one less thing to worry about as far as a component or something breaking down. Yeah, I hadn't bought a bike in probably, I don't know, 15 years or so. And so when I got it, I got a new Giant recently, and it's just so amazing how efficient the change is in gears. You know, my old Trek when I was in high school, you, you'd, you'd click it and then you'd hear the, tra- the chain rattle, 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 then, you know, a couple of cranks, then it would finally get there. But it's an immediate change, which is so nice when you're, you got to change speed or you were going downhill, now uphill. It's so that was something that I noticed that it would be just, it's so great to have that. Yeah, and they're even now taking it to electronic shifting where you don't even have the cables for the shifter. It's just electronically, you can just... Oh, you know, wow. Press a button, um, whether it be the front or the rear chain rings, um, and and make the changes that way. So it's and then disc brakes is uh, just being coming more and more common. I suspect within the next five years, almost all bikes, no matter mountain bike, road, um, touring, whatever, will have disc brakes. And I think that's one of the big changes that we've seen too on bikes. Um, so transitioning now to like your commuter or urban type bike, um, just kind of going to work, going, uh, bombing around, uh, town a little bit there. What are some things you're looking for there? Obviously it's not as specialized. And so you're probably not going to be spending what you would for a, you know, a, a really good, uh, mountain bike or a really efficient, uh, light road bike. So what are some things that people might look for in your commuter or urban bike? Um, one of the most important things is going to be comfort. A lot of those bikes have a little bit more of an upright posture, which I think for most people is, of course, more comfortable. Um, the other thing, too, I'd be looking for, you know, are you going to be carrying bags on the bike? Um, can the bike have the ability to have a rack on it? Uh, can the bike have the ability to have fenders on it? That's, you know, if you're a commuter or uh, a rider that's going to the grocery store or um, even a fitness rider, it's nice to have those fenders. And again, if you need to carry things, does is your bike equipped to carry or have a rack attached to it so you can put bags, panniers, or even just the old milk craton on top of the, the rack and just bungee cord it down so you can carry things. So that, that works too. Mm-hmm. You said that's your, your biggest growth you've seen has been in the kind of commuter urban bike? 
that and mountain biking. Um, those, those two we have seen, and, and it's been really interesting. Like we just had a gentleman here actually. He was rented a bike from us, um, and he, at the start of the COVID period, he said, okay, I, I have to lose some weight. And over the past year and four months, so 16 months, he's lost uh, 140 pounds oh, wow. um, over that period. And he said, strictly cycling. And when he was here, he rented from us three days, um, different styles of bikes to do different things. And um, we're seeing more and more people seeing cycling as a, a low impact fun way to exercise and be out of doors and enjoy fresh air and now with e-bikes becoming far more prevalent than previously it's it's adding another dimension for people they can go out further they can stay out a little bit longer um, often they will, will go out more often on an e-bike than on a standard bike so that's really helped and, and for some people in fact the first e-bike we sold was to a gentleman who had ms hmm. and he was an avid cyclist and rode into work almost every day from valley to downtown. So it was about 11 miles commute one way. And he just could not handle that any longer. Um, but with an e-bike and the assist, we just, we just sell the assist, which is uh, pedal assist. There's no throttle on the bike. Um, he didn't do it every day, but he was up to about three days a week and, and just said, you know, it's just given me another lease on life that I thought I may have lost. And so it's, it's a lot of different people getting an e-bike for a lot of different reasons. That's great. Uh, before we get to the e-bikes, I want to hit on the mountain bike. Um, what are you looking for there, especially when it comes to if you want a full suspension versus uh, a hardtail? Um, what would be the difference? What would be the applications? When would you want to get um, the full suspension versus versus not? Well, the full suspension, if, if you're doing some really serious um, single track downhill or even just very technical trail riding, uh, the full suspension as an element that um, no other bike can, although some of the hardtail bikes nowadays, are, are the geometry and the tires and, and the suspension are front, they'll never equal a full suspension, but they're, they're doing some pretty amazing things with some of those bikes. So. It's more for the, you know, some years doing um, a flow track, single track downhill, like I was mentioning, or some really technical riding, whether it be downhill, uphill, or, or whatever, then the full suspension really can make uh, a lot of difference. And then the, the hardtail, you know, a lot of parents want to go riding with their children and they just want to be on a, because uh, the kids want a mountain bike and so they, the parents want to get a mountain bike. And, we, you know, there's no need for a full, full suspension at that point, just the weights, added weights, and just the added cost of full suspension. So a hard tail is great there. If somebody is just doing hard packed trails, maybe a little bit of technical stuff here and there for a short bit on the trail, um, a hard tail mountain bike does very, very well in, in those circumstances, particularly now with the largest sort of plus tires that I mentioned earlier. We're just not your standard 1.95 to 2.1, but you can get a 2.8 on there and take your pressure down or even go tubeless and they can, the bikes can become very compliant to the surfaces you're on. Um, the tubeless thing was kind of, kind of new to me. So what's the, what's the deal with the tubeless and how does that work and why would it be better than the old traditional tubes? Well, it's interesting. It's following the auto industry. You know, many, many years ago you had an inner tube and then the tire, but I don't know how long it's been now, but that's sort of gone away completely. So most, tires on vehicles or all bike tires on vehicles now there's tubeless and so cycling went to the same thing um, one of the reasons particularly um, for mountain bikers is flats you know getting um, pinch flats and things like that this with um, tubeless that's sort of that's not going to happen just for the very reason that it's tubeless and also you have um, in the tire itself um, if you do hit a tack or um, something punctures the tire, the, the, the tire is filled with a, a gel that will, as soon as air hits that, it, it will uh, seal that part of the tire so that you can keep riding. You don't have to worry about stopping and um, dismounting and <laughs> replacing it in the tube or 
something like that. So there's a lot of advantages that way too. And it's just a little bit lighter too without having the tire in there or the inner tube in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then you mentioned f the fat tires and fat tires with studs are the two separate things there. Um, do you see most of those with like mountain bikes or commuter bikes or kind of the winter biking? What, uh, what would you, what do you got on that? Oh, the, f the fat tires with studs, you know, the true fat tire, you're up at four inches up to five inches, um, with studs. They, they are sort of the snow sands. Um, and around here in Juneau and I'm certain in Ketchikan, a lot of our trails can be rocky and rooty. Um, and those big tires just roll over things, um, I liken it to the ski industry when they went to the fat skis and how that sort of an equalizer in a lot of ways for skiing or made it easier for people to handle certain situations in skiing. And, and same with the fat tire bike. It's, it's, um, it's a little more forgiving in certain circumstances when you're on the trail. And like I said, particularly a rocky, rooty trail or pure parts of the trail that are like that. And I have a friend that takes his dogs out of the Minhole Lake um, and he has a fat tire bike. In fact, it was one of the first ones purchased in Juneau. And he also has uh, studs on, those, on that. And then on his um, shoes, he has yak tracks. So when he stops and puts his feet down on the ice, you know, obviously the bike is secure, but his feet don't slip from underneath him too. So that's, that's a popular aspect to it. So a fat tire bike in Juneau, a lot of people are just using year round. Um, now, I don't know if you want to commute 20 miles on a fat tire bike, but... <laughs> Um, they, they do a lot of things equally well. And of course, in the winter on the snow, um, they do very well too. Mm -hmm. And then I was just mentioning a lot of plus size tires now that bikes are coming with that just again, make them a little more compliant with the, the surfaces around, particularly if you're doing some more aggressive technical work. Mm -hmm. And so now to the e-bikes, you talked about pedal assist earlier. Um, and you also have, uh, e-bikes with the throttle. Well, I, there, that's models that are that are available out there. Uh, so, what have you seen as far as like a good e-bike? Um, either way, like what's uh, what are you looking for if you or why would you want an e-bike? Uh, now, the e-bikes that we carry are just strictly the pedal assist, so they will only engage the motor when you pedal, um, and that we don't carry the throttle um, bikes. With those, they are. If you're over 20 miles an hour, then you have to register the bike as a vehicle. Um, but with the pedal assist, like I was mentioning earlier, sometimes people um, physically are, are struggling cycling or cycling for a period of time. So this gives them, extends that opportunity. For other people, if the spouse is quicker on a pedal bike than, than their partner, um, we have a couple of people where one person rides the pedal bike and the other rides the assist and, and they can go out riding together. Although typically the assist rider is going to be at the top of the hill quicker than the pedal um, bike. So there's, <laughs> there's that aspect to it. And then the other piece too is that um, as people um, age, they just would perhaps like some more assist when they're riding and they still really enjoy riding, but they would, would, prefer to have that pedal assist and there's different like the bikes we have typically have four speeds you can start at ego ego <laughs> eco and then go all the way up to turbo um, at the top but um, there's a lot of opportunities there also for people with the e-bikes in that they can um, do some things perhaps that they ha weren't comfortable doing before such as going for a little bit longer ride um, a little more hillier ride. Um, that, and, I've, and I've followed some of the studies that have come out, what, getting some fairly good longitudinal studies now, that an average rider on a pedal bike and an average rider on an e-bike are going to exert about the same amount of um, energy when they're riding. And the reason for that is the e-bike riders typically stay out a little bit longer, go a little bit further, and ride a little bit more often so, than just the pedal, something on a pedal bike. So yes, are they out there longer on their bike? They are, but they are getting about the same amount. It's not cheating, but they're getting about the same amount of physical exertion as they would um, somebody who's on a standard pedal bike hmm. in, in normal circumstances. Now, if you're training for, you know, the Ironman or, you know, a century ride or something like that, that you might be a little bit different. But for the normal commuter around the block, going to the grocery store type of riders. It's just been really interesting to follow that. 
Yeah. Well, there's really not many trails on Prince of Wales or in the Ketchikan area. So I think one of the things that I like to do is just go on the logging roads, but those can get a little bit boring. So it would be kind of nice to be able to get way further. So I think uh, doing that pedal assist, you know, I'd probably go definitely a further distance um, just because, you know, it's a logging road. You don't have that same sort of, you know, looking for the, the texture in it and it's not technical, it's just road. And so I think uh, speeding through some of that monotony would be, would be kind of nice. Well, the other aspect too for an e-bike are those who are on a flow track somewhere and they're um, or a single track and we have one close to our house and I see them go all the t- by all the time. So when you finish the ride and you're at the bottom of the trail, you know, rather than having to just manually pedal all the way back up to the top and go down again, you know, you just put it into the e-assist mode and, and you're back up the top fairly quickly and so you can actually put in more runs then um, it's somebody like somebody ski, skinning up the mountain to come down on skis or they're taking the lift to go up and come down on their skis. So um, a lot of people are actually enjoy it for that reason. Yeah, for sure. That sounds good. Um, what about um, other buying considerations? Um, you, you talked about the types a little bit, uh, talked about usage. Is there any other things that uh, people might consider if they're in the market for buying a bike? Sizing is critical. Um, do a little bit of research beforehand. Just and there's a lot of um, opportunities there. Just knowing your height, your inseam, and making certain you you know what size bike, and and going to an independent bike dealer and talking to them and and letting them know what kind of riding you want to do and, and get them have them size you on the bikes and. If uh, some bike geometries are just a little bit different than others, and so it's always nice to make certain that the bike that you are going to buy is the one that fits you. Mm -hmm. Um, That's critical. And then obviously things, you know, um, safety-wise helmets, we mentioned lights earlier, just daytime lights on my road bikes. All my road bikes have daytime lights on them that are on while while I'm riding. Um, And, you know, if, if, you know, if you're in Southeast Alaska, I would definitely think about fenders, getting fenders on your bike. Makes it just a little pleasant, saves your clothes a little bit more, and actually saves the you know the the drivetrain just a little bit more also. Mm-hmm. What about maintenance? I think that's a huge thing too. Like you're getting a lot of, you know, especially up there, you got to like glacial silt. And there's a lot of opportunity for very fine particles to get into to these things. So as far as maintenance components, is it uh, rinse after each one? Do you want to be spraying but not pressure washing? Soap, no soap. What uh, what's the basic maintenance after a ride? Well, for me, there's just a hose at the side of the house, and, and I, I don't feel it turned on full bore. And I just I stay away from where the seat goes into the frame or where you know, handlebars attach to the, the um, stem and down to the fork. Stay away from those sort of points, but mainly focusing on the drivetrain and the disc brakes, um, getting those cleaned off nicely. And ideally, the one of the best things you can do if you can keep your bike in a heated dry area like your garage or or some other spot uh, in the house that can make a huge difference as far as your bike um, the longevity of it and then just um i do not put any lube on my chain until i can see just a little bit of rust forming or i just go out the door and i can feel it creaking a little bit then i just put a small amount of lube on actually i wipe that off run the chain through a rag a couple of times um, rotations through just to get that excess off because any lube is going to attract um, some facial silt other grime that's on the road and the other thing is if you're actively riding um, go into your local bike shop and talk to them and have them measure your chain um, if you're an active commuter gosh every three months or so go and have them measure your chain because the chain actually does stretch and as it does stretch it'll start to wear down the teeth on your chain ring and your cassette in the rear and, and i've learned this lesson <laughs> a couple of times um, you let that happen over time then you're looking at a whole new dri- drivetrain chain uh, chain drive train up front as far as the chain rings there and the cassette on the back, the gears in the back. And that can be expensive as opposed to just changing a, a chain. Mm-hmm. Do you have, like in your maintenance thing, do you like walk through, if someone's going to buy a bike from you, do, do you walk through the, the maintenance that they should, they should do? Um, is there like a video or something like that? Or 
Um, are you available to people if they buy a bike to, to help them kind of through that? If, if they did, I think a couple of my friends ordered some, uh, some bikes from you guys, like, could they call you and get some, some insight or FaceTime you about some, uh, some maintenance? Um, I don't know if we do a good as job as we should on that, to be quite honest with you, Jeff. Um, we, you know, there's, there's some basic things we talk to people when they, you know, buy, buy the bike about, about the bike, but, um, we should perhaps do a better job on, on the cleaning, lubrication and, um, measuring the, uh, the length of the chain and so forth. If, if we have active commuters, um, who come in and having their bike, we measure it right away anyway. And, and so we can just let them know, okay, look, you've got about another month or so here, but we'll need to change this chain pretty quickly. So. Yeah. Um, when we see things come in, we, we, we let people know. And you do have rentals too. Do I, uh, I see that right. Are you like concerned with, uh, how hard people are on your bikes? It's kind of the old rental car thing where people are really tough on rental cars because it's not their own. Do you see that people are, are pretty yeah. gentle with your bikes or do they ride them hard or you figure it's a rental. That's what it's for. How do you feel about the rental? Um, you know, they, they, they do get a little banged up at times. Um, our mechanics, typically we go through the bikes, not every time they come back. Obviously if somebody makes a comment about something, so it's just not shifting quite right on this gear or that gear, we get into right away, but they're, they're looking at the bikes pretty regularly. And you do that cosmetically though, they will get dinged up over time. And the mechanically, you know, they're, they're in great shape. We, we take pride in making certain the bikes run as they should. And, um, but you know, one of the things we have to be careful too is when people are transporting our bikes somewhere that we they make we make sure that the manner in which they're transporting them, you know, if they're in the back of a pickup truck or something like that, that they're protected and and uh, you know none of the derailleurs are not going to get bent out of shape or spokes um, getting bent, things like that. So that's that's a critical piece for us. But for the most part, people are pretty good, and a lot of our bikes have kickstands, so that's nice. So they don't have to lie them on the ground or put them up against a tree or something like that. So that that's very helpful. That's great. Well, do you have anything else to, to add or to, you know, pitch the store? You can tell people uh, where to find you and all that stuff. Yep. No, we've, we're here in Juneau. We're the bright red building on the corner of eighth and Egan. Um, and we're running actually two blocks from the whale statue. So uh, we've got a great variety of bikes. I'm getting more and more in stock. We've been fortunate that we've been able to keep a pretty good stock of bikes in a time where bikes are hard to find. Yeah. So, um, don't feel bashful, just come on by. And then everything's online too. It's cycleak.com. We ship bikes throughout the state. So we've, we've sent a lot of bikes throughout Southeast, even furthest one so far is being to, um, it's either between Kodiak or Bethel. Yeah. I can't remember. Oh, wow. Excellent. So very good. Uh, and did you have social media? Yes. Yep, Facebook. Um, we're on Twitter also. Okay, and then um, are there events that uh, that that go on up there? We do. We we do a number of different events. We help sponsor a number of events. Also, right now we're running what we call our Cycle Alaska PE program, where kids can do a certain number of minutes per week. It's an eight-week program, and each week we have uh, small gifts for them. They come in, put their name up, put a sticker beside their name that they completed that week, got their all their minutes in. And then at the end of the eight-week period, those who've completed all eight weeks are eligible for a, um, a drawing for a, mountain, for a kid's mountain bike. So that program right now, I think we had about 110 kids enrolled in that program. So that's a fun program that we, we provide. And then through the winter, we do our bike adventure series. We're... Gina Whites, who have taken um, kind of taken a tour through the southern states or gone over and done a tour on the Danube, Danube in, uh, in uh, Europe or done something in, uh, in Asia, going through Vietnam and so on, just give a one-hour presentation and, and then they take questions after that. And those have been very, very popular. Didn't have them last year for obvious reasons, but we're going to be starting those back up this winter. That's awesome. Oh, there's, there's a bunch of other things that we do locally here too. Um, we had a bike. Um, we didn't do a bike to work day this, this year. We um, 
we did a community bike ride. So just anybody get out and ride their bikes. And we had paired up with another um, store in the valley and um, people get a button that they bike that day. And, and then we had some more small drawings, just, just getting people out on bikes. That's awesome. Well, great. I appreciate uh, you taking some time out of your day to, to talk to me and uh, appreciate what you're doing, uh, the local business and helping people out. Well, that's that's important. We we feel strongly a lot of things we do. Communities being good to us that we believe strongly in paying our civic rent and giving back. And we do some donation programs throughout the community too. So that's that's um, we like doing that also. Awesome, great. Well, thanks again, John. Take care and uh, enjoy the rest of your summer. Thanks, Jeff, and you also. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye bye.